Hey there, welcome to chapter 25, Phylogenies and the History of Life. By the end of this chapter, you should be able to analyze evolutionary relationships by looking at evolutionary trees. You should be able to draw alternative trees that mean the same thing. You should be able to build a tree from a small data matrix. All right, you should also be able to discuss the major strengths and limitations of the fossil record and use examples to explain, um, I guess, how and why ad adaptive radiations occur and then um, compare and contrast the causes of mass extinction and also background extinction. So because biologists use these two major analytical tools to reconstruct the history of, the, of life, phylogenetic trees and the fossil record, we're going to be covering both of them in the same lecture. So most of the lecture is about phylogenetic trees and what they mean and how they work. And then the last bit talks about the fossil record a little bit and the history of life on Earth. Okay, so we need to go over some vocabulary. So the first word is phylogeny, um, and phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a group of organisms. Um, and a phylogenetic tree is a graphical summary of a phylogeny. So sometimes people use the word phylogeny when they mean phylogenetic tree. Fine, whatever. Um, but a phylogenetic tree shows evolutionary relationships amongst, it could be genes or species or higher taxa. So this tree is showing the relationship between major groups of animals, like birds and crocodilians and turtles. But you can see smaller trees that show you just maybe populations within a species. Um, or if you see some of the evolutionary trees that um, are around right now for COVID-19, those are gene trees that are showing the relationship between, um, or not even gene trees, just DNA or RNA-based trees that show nucleotide differences between strains. Okay, so the use of phylogenetic trees has been a major revolution in how evolution is studied, and so you can do lots of things with phylogenetic trees. As we talked about in the previous lecture, we can use them to define species. So anyone remember what the name of the species concept is? Yeah, it's the phylogenetic species concept! Yeah, so you can define a species as a single branch on the tree of life. We use phylogenetic trees to study the spread of disease, um, like with COVID-19. Um, or if you take Bio 3401, I talk a lot about how we can predict which strains of the influenza virus will um, should go into the into the vaccine for the following year um, using phylogenetic trees. We can also help identify species for conservation. So do you remember in the last um, lecture we talked about the dusky seaside sparrow? Oh, that was a very sad story. They bred the wrong strains together and it died. Yeah. Um, so we can help decide which species, um, which individuals of each species we should preserve for conservation or to use for breeding programs. And then finally, to identify wild species for breeding with current crops. So, for example, if we have a crop and we want to add a particular gene to that crop, it's usually the most efficient if we can find a wild species that's most closely related to the um, to the crop species to be able to locate that gene that we need. All right, so vocabulary more. A branch represents a population through time. So this is a branch here. This is the lamprey branch. This is a cartilaginous fish branch. Time-wise, um, this little stem down here is a long time ago, and these tips here are the present. So the branch is through time from a long time ago to the present. Okay, a node or a fork is the point where a branch split. So that um, little branching point really represents a population of individuals that contains the most recent common ancestor of, for example, the lampreys and everybody else. The tip or the terminal node, right? Tip, 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 tip. Um, these represent the endpoints of the branch. So these are the, the actual groups that we can see, right? Um, so this is a lamprey. So, you know, the tip represents an existing species that we can identify, right? Along the length of the branch, we don't really know what was going on there, right? We just know that, that there were ancestors to this group that occurred in the past, right? All right, the root is the most ancestral branch in the tree. So that's that little part. And when we make a tree, we'll often use an outgroup. So that's a taxon. Do you guys want to remind me what a taxon is? Yeah, it's like any kind of a group, like a phylum or a genus or family. Yeah. Um, 
So an outgroup is a taxon that diverged before the taxa that we're actually interested in studying. And we, we say that the outgroup helps us root the tree. And mainly what that means is if we want to know what the ancestor of our group of, of organisms looks like, we would maybe pick a more distantly related species on the presumption that that species may have some more resemblance to the ancestor. Sometimes on our trees, uh, we end up with a polytomy, which I think we talked about. So polytomy is a node that divides into three or more branches. And what we mean by this, we don't mean that this original population underwent speciation in like a three-way split, right? Um, so this little node here, what, what it means is it's split and then it split again very quickly, and we don't know which split happened first. You know, did placentals and mammals happen first and then monotremes, or marsupials and monotremes happen first and then placentals, or, you know, placentals and monotremes first and then marsupials. We don't really know. So we reflect this uncertainty with this, like, kind of comb-like split called a polytomy. All right, so let's match these up, okay? Maybe we'll start over here. What is a point where a branch splits on a tree? Oh, that's a node! Yeah. What re represents a population through time on a tree? A branch. Yeah. What's a way of suggesting that not enough data was available to resolve which taxa are most closely related? It's a polytomy! Yeah. What's a taxon that diverged before your focal taxa? That's an outgroup! What's a node that divides into three or more branches? That's a polytomy again! Yep. What represents a hypothetical most recent ancestor on a tree? Oh, that's a node! Yeah. What represents a living or extinct taxon on a tree? The tips. Yep. And what is the most ancestral branch on the tree? The root. Okay. So let's look at things here. What's this? That's a node! What about this? That's a tip. And that's a polytomy. Okay, what's this one? That's a node. All right, what's this one? Branch. What's this one? It's a branch. It is a branch, but it's also something else. What else could it be? Could also be an outgroup. Yeah, because this branch branched off before the rest of the other individuals in the tree. Okay. All right, so one thing that we should clarify is that any taxa that you're looking at are on the tips of the branch. They're never within the branch, okay? Because the way that evolution works, you don't have, um, for example, uh, dinosaurs slowly morphing into, you know, um, Archaeopteryx morphing into birds. Instead, you have some event in the past in which you had a speciation event that resulted in dinosaurs separating from Archaeopteryx and you know, multiple speciation events that occurred between Archaeopteryx and the bird, okay? Um, so we, this isn't right. This can't happen, okay? Instead, we have the species, the, the, the species that we know about are on the tips, and this represents how they're related to one another. So if you have two species that are uh, more closely related to each other than anyone else, we say that they're sister groups, and they share a recent common ancestor. Okay, that recent, oh, and the nodes represent speciation events. So, hey, name two ways that you can have a speciation event. St. Patrick's speciation. Yeah, St. Patrick's speciation, and what else? Allo Patrick's speciation. Yeah, Allo Patrick's speciation. Okay. So, speciation with or without a geographic barrier. I uh, should also point out that. This node here represents a population of individuals, and so we think that probably the population that represents the ancestor of the lampreys and the other fish kind of look like this little guy here, some kind of a weird jawless, gross thing, okay? Um, and that no longer exists, right? And we think that the ancestor of the sharks and the fish kind of may look like this guy, but he no longer exists either, okay? All right, another thing that's important to note is that the branches of trees can rotate at each node, okay? So um, there are multiple trees that mean the same thing. And I tell you that not because I'm going to try and trick you and, you know, show you different trees, but because, or I'm not going to trick you and show you different trees that mean the same thing, 
but the main thing is that you will draw trees for me, and you'll draw them the whichever way is much most convenient for you, right? And you need to be able to figure out if the tree that you've drawn is the same as the tree that other people have drawn. So you have to be able to rotate the trees. So I think the easiest thing to do is just think about what's happening in the tree and talk it through with each tree to see if um, the relationships are the same. So what this tree is saying is three and four are sister species, sister groups. They're more closely related to each other than anyone else. And we can tell that because they've speciated most recently, right? All right, we can tell that three and four are more closely related to two than to one because three and four split apart from two here, right? They split apart from one all the way down here. Okay, so three and four are more closely related to each other than anyone else. They're next most closely related to two. And then two, three, and four are next most closely related to one. Okay, so we can rotate around this node here between three and four, and then that would look like this, right? But if we say the words, it comes out the same. Three and four are more closely related to each other than they are to two. And then these three are more closely related to each other than they are to one. Okay, um, we can rotate around this node here, right, which gives us this tree. But if we talk it through, three and four are more closely related to each other than to anything else. And three and four are more closely related to two than to one. Yep, still true. We can rotate around here too. Three and four are more closely related to anyone else, to each other than anyone else. Um, three and four are more closely related to two than to one. And we can also rotate around multiple nodes. Three and four are more closely related to each other than anyone else. Three and four are more closely related to two than to one. Okay. All right, so as I mentioned, a, phylogen a phylogenetic tree is a hypothesis that we can test. And so the relationships that are in the phylogenetic trees, um, we estimate them using the best available data from whatever source we can get it from. So if you're trying to make a phylogenetic tree, the first thing you have to do is figure out which taxa are you comparing and which characteristics are you using to compare them. Um, when we're talking about a character, we're referring to any genetic, morphological, physiological, or behavioral characteristic to be studied. So it could be something like um, a character could be a series of, you know, like a DNA sequence. It could be a morphological trait. It could be a physiological thing, like a metabolic pathway. It could even be a behavioral characteristic. So in this data matrix, we've gone really simple, and we've picked the characters skull, limbs, hair, and milk. And the groups we're looking at are the lizard, the dog, and the human. And we're using lungfish as an outgroup. Okay? And we pick simple traits where you either have them or don't. Right? So the lungfish has a skull, but no limbs, hair, or milk. Lizard has a skull and limbs, but no hair and milk. The dog, has, the dog and the human have all four. Okay? So if we plot these characters on the tree, right? Um, we can see that the skull, all of them have a skull, so the mutation for skull occurred before the first split um, that separated the different groups. So the skull occurred here. By the way, if I ask you to draw where something occurred on a tree, you can't just write the word, you actually have to draw the line. So I can see that you know that you mean here and not, for example, here. That would mean something different. Okay. So in the past, if we, I like to imagine I'm like driving a little car through this evolutionary tree. So I'm driving down this road. Okay, I get to this point. There's a mutation that occurs, um, and that mutation is beneficial and it spreads. So now, um, you know, the population mostly has skulls. And you get to this point. There's a speciation event, sympatric or allopatric, that causes one lineage to go this way, and one lineage to go this way. In this lineage, they never get a mutation for limbs, so they don't have limbs. In this lineage, at a certain point, they get a mutation for limbs that spreads. And so if you continue on this road, everybody from here on out has limbs. So now we've gotten to this branching point here, so there's a population here that has an allopatric or a sympatric speciation event. And if you go on this lineage, they have a couple of mutations for hair and milk. So everyone up from here on out has hair and milk. But this lineage doesn't get that mutation, so no hair, no milk. One question we often ask is whether a trait is ancestral or derived. So an ancestral trait is some kind of a character state that existed in the ancestor. And a derived trait is one that is a modified form of the ancestral trait. So you find it 
not in the ancestor, but you find it in a descendant of that ancestor. And the terms ancestral and derived are very much context dependent. They depend on what taxa you're comparing. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. So on this tree, right, um, something like, um, let's see, so we say that having a skull would be an ancestral trait for everybody on the tree, right, versus having hair and milk would be a derived trait that's only shared by dog and human. If our tree was, for example, a tree of all mammals, right, um, and you had lots and lots of branchings for all the different mammals, they all have hair and milk, but each group has their own unique traits after that. So we would say for a tree of all mammals, hair and milk is ancestral, and the other traits, um, like, I don't know, having large canine teeth, being able to walk on your hind legs, right, those are derived traits. Uh, if we go the other direction, so right here we have skull as a as an ancestral trait, but let's say our tree wasn't just lungfish, lizard, dog, human, but our tree also included like invertebrates, like crabs and um, you know echinoderms and stuff like that, and um, and sponges and jellyfish, right? On that tree, having a skull would be a derived trait because none of the um, other species would have it except for this set of four. Okay. Um, we use an outgroup to establish whether a trait is ancestral or derived. So we pick, a, an, we pick an outgroup that we think represents the ancestor that lived in this population here. Okay, And so whichever traits are like this outgroup we say are ancestral because we're guessing that this lungfish is like the ancestor here. And then if it looks different than that ancestor we say the trait is derived. But it can be really hard to pick an outgroup um, and so sometimes you can end up with multiple outgroups that are being used to estimate phylogenetic relationships, just in case you don't correctly pick an outgroup that represents um, what the ancestor looked like. All right, so looking at this phylogeny, what traits do sharks have? They're scary. Okay, well, they are scary, but that's not a trait on this tree. What, what trait do they have on this tree? They got jaws. Yeah, they got jaws, right? So if we start in the past, we go up to here, there's a splitting event, we go follow this one here, jaws, they got jaws to sharks. Do they have a dentary bone? No, they got no dentary bone. Nope, no dentary bone. Um, based on this phylogeny, turtles are most closely related to what? Huh, wolves, that's silly. Turtles and wolves are like, not at all alike. I know, but on this tree, they're more closely related to each other than anybody else. Pah. All right, so how many monophyletic groups or clades can you find? Do you remember what a monophyletic group is? Yeah, monophyletic group is an ancestor and all of its descendants. Yeah. All right. So could I say here that this lineage of lamprey, this lamprey branch, is a monophyletic group? Sure, why not? Yeah, sure, why not? What about shark? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, trout? I guess. Turtle? Yeah, I like them turtles. Wolf? Yep. Okay, let's find other monophyletic groups. Uh, what about turtle and wolf? Yep, I like that one. Okay, what about like the shark and the trout? Because they're fish. Well, they are fish, but are they a monophyletic group? I don't know, they're fish. Well, where's the ancestor of the shark and the trout? Here, point with your, your paw. <laughs> there. Okay, so does that group include the ancestor and all of its descendants? I guess not, because it kicks out the turtle and the wolf. Okay, so shark and trout is not a monophyletic group. But what about shark, trout, turtle, and wolf? Yeah, I guess. Okay, and I see one more, I see another group here. What else can we do? Trout, turtle, wolf. Yeah, trout, turtle, wolf, and one more. Oh, you could have everybody, like the whole tree. Yeah, you could have the whole tree. Lamprey, shark, trout, turtle, wolf. All right, let's talk about synapomorphies. So a synapomorphy is a shared derived trait. So if you see sin, what does that mean? 
damn insane. All right. Um, apo is like the word apex. So what's apex? That means the top. Yeah. And morphe? That means forms. Okay. So they're shared kind of top forms. So it means shared the top meaning like the tip top means something that happened more recently in your tree. Okay. So synapomorphy is a trait that is present in the most recent common ancestor, but it's missing in more distant ancestors. So if this is your monophyletic group, this is a, this is a trait that your group shares and that the ancestors don't have. Okay. So it's a synapomorphy for your monophyletic group. Um, so a monophyletic group um, is the same thing as a clade. Okay. So both of those are evolution as an evolutionary unit that includes an ancestral population and all of its descendants, but no others. And monophyletic groups will share synapomorphies with each other. All right, we're also going to talk a little bit about polyphyletic groups and paraphyletic groups, um, but I'll just introduce them right now. So a polyphyletic group is an unnatural group. So like if you had a group of like wormy things, right, that would be a polyphyletic group because it might include like worms and snakes and legless lizards and things like that, and millipedes that are not um, related to each other because they do not have a common ancestor. Um, and a paraphyletic group is a group in which you kind of kick out one of the individuals. So, um, for example, um, if you were to, I don't know, kick whales out of the mammals because they don't have fur, right, then that would be a paraphyletic group. Or in the group that we just looked at, if you looked at fish and we kicked out the turtle and the wolf, that would be a paraphyletic group. All right, so here's some potential problems. Um, you could find, when you're trying to make your tree, you're trying to find similar traits, right? And you're thinking that the similarity means that those groups have a common evolutionary history, but you could have a trait that's similar due to independent evolutionary events and not due to common ancestry. And sometimes what can happen is you get a reversal in a character change, and it makes it look like nothing happened. So, for example, um, the loss of limbs in snakes. So snakes have no legs, lizards have legs. If you were looking at number of limbs as a way to categorize um, organisms, you would say that snakes and lizards are quite different, right? Um, but, for example, if you were to look at things like egg, the amniotic egg, that snakes have and lizards also have are extremely similar. So if we look at the egg, we would say that these two groups are similar, but if we look at the legs, we'd say they're different. So species can often form one monophyletic group based on one trait, but a different monophyletic group using another trait. All right, so in lab, we're gonna work on making phylogenetic trees. And one question that we come to, because you can make so many different kinds of trees, which tree is the best? And so we say that the best tree is the one that includes the least number of changes, um, and that's known as parsimony. The most parsimonious tree is the tree with the least number of, of changes. And, you know, for real, we do this using computer programs, um, but we can show you some simple examples so you can get what the computer programs are doing. Uh, and we think that the tree with the fewest evolutionary changes is the most, one, is the most likely to um, reflect evolution because each one of these changes is precipitated by some mutation or innovation or something like that happening, or a change. And mutations are rare, so the odds on, for example, um, you know, having a mutation for hair in both the dog lineage and the human lineage is very unusual. It seems more likely that hair, that mutation, occurred one time and spread rapidly. Okay, so for that reason, we assume that because these uh, synapomorphies are are rare, when you get a, an unusual trait appearing, um, this is probably like a once-in-a-lifetime thing. All right, so oh, let's go back and look at this tree here. So on this tree, um, we've plotted skull, limbs, hair, and milk, right? And on this tree, we say that the dog and the human are more closely related to each other than anything else, and then the, then the lizard is next most closely related, than the, than, and then the lungfish, which is the outgroup. We think that the skull appeared at the base of the tree because all of them have a skull. Limbs probably appeared after the lungfish lineage split apart from the lizard dog human lineage because all three of these have legs. And that hair and milk probably 
um, appeared on the lineage leading to dogs and humans. So this is a tree with just like four, four events happening in it. Let's just say you had an alternative hypothesis, though, that humans were more closely related to lizards um, than they were to dogs. Okay, um, and so in order for this tree to be true, okay, so this skull thing doesn't change, right? But over here, this changes. So um, dogs have hair and humans have hair. So we'd have to have some event in which humans and dogs have hair, right, happening here. But then lizards don't have hair, so they would have had to have lost the trait. Alternatively, you could have said that hair and milk appeared here and then also over there, right? But either way, you have an extra set of events that had to happen in order to make this tree, okay? So this is not the most parsimonious tree. Uh, this one is the most parsimonious tree. Um, there are other tree choosing methods besides parsimony. So if you take bio 1113, we'll touch on these a little bit. So there are genetic distance methods, likelihood methods, and Bayesian methods. And, but the goal of any of these methods is the same. The goal is to find the best tree that most likely represents the evolutionary history of this lineage. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through this exercise here. The goal is to figure out which tree is the most parsimonious. So you have three species, one, two, and three, and then two outgroups, O1 and O2. Okay, so um, we can see here one has um, brown fur, and two has brown fur, and three has yellow fur, right? One has brown fur, two has brown fur, three has yellow fur. Okay, and what we're seeing here is two possible trees, one that has one and two more closely related, and the other that has two and three more closely related. And then for these two trees, we plot two different ways that you could have had the brown fur and the yellow fur happen to create what we currently see, which is that one and two have brown fur and three is yellow fur. Okay? All right, so um, the first thing to do is see how many different evolutionary events would have had to have happened to create these three trees. So how many evolutionary events had to happen in tree A? I think it's just the one. I think there was like brown hair appeared like on the branch that goes to one and two. Okay, that's good. What about um, tree B? How many evolutionary events? It looks like two, you know, like one along the one branch and one along the two branch. Yeah. And what about tree C? That's also two, but it's like, like they got the brown fur and then three lost it later. Yeah. Okay. So those are all the evolutionary events. So which tree is the most parsimonious? Oh, it's tree A is the most parsimonious because there's only one change and the other two trees got two changes. Yep. That's the right answer. Okay. So we are mostly focusing on cladograms in this class, but um, cladograms are trees that just focus on branching patterns. So we just make like the length between the branches just arbitrary to look pretty. Okay. So they look very nice and regular like this because we're not interested in the length of the branches meaning anything. We just want to demonstrate, you know, these two are more closely related to each other than they are to the other groups, etc. There are other methods to create trees where branch length means something. And so you might see these in published papers. So for example, in this, exa in this uh, kind of tree, the branch length represents the number of base substitutions per site. What do they mean by base? That's nucleotides. Yeah, nucleotides. And what site? That's like where the nucleotide is. Yeah. Okay. So it's like the number of, I don't know, mutations that have happened. Okay. And so you can see here, here's like a ancestral population and then this lineage is very similar to the ancestor, but this one's very different. And then the scale represents the number of base substitutions. This one is one that you'll see sometimes when you're looking at a lineage that involves extinct and maybe all extinct or extinct and um, extant species. And so what it's showing you is how long ago it was. So everything that lives up to the zero time is still alive, but things that whose lines end earlier went extinct earlier. All right, let's talk a little bit about homology versus homoplasy. So homology is what we say happens when traits are similar due to shared ancestry. You know, so these two women look similar, 
because they have a relative in common, right? Homoplasia occurs when traits are similar for either reasons other than a common ancestry. So, you know, these guys are similar because they're both Elvis impersonators. Okay, so you can get homoplasy um, when you have convergent evolution. So if you have two different, very different lineages that are both adapting to live in the same environment, like the desert or the ocean or something like that, they can end up looking similar, even though they're not close relatives, because they've both convergently adapted to the same place. Um, okay, so... Um, when we make when we make our monophyletic groups, they should have they should have synapomorphies, right? Um, uh, shared derived traits, but also when you look at this group, this individual and this individual and this individual and this individual, they'll all have some similarities to one another because their ancestor had those same traits and passed it on to all of them. If you have a homoplasy, it means that you may have two different lineages that look similar for some reason, um, but that reason is is not because uh, that reason wasn't inherited from their common relative. So, for example, you have multiple lineages in which hairlessness has appeared, right, from a haired ancestor. Um, so a polyphyletic group, again, is an unnatural group in which you have, you know, maybe they all have something in common. Maybe they all have web feet, or maybe, you know, could be worm-like guys or whatever. Um, and the ancestor of all those different worm-like guys was not worm-like himself, um, so they do not look alike because they inherited the trait from a common ancestor. Um, and it should be noted that within, you know, even one species, some of their characteristics are likely to be homologous with other characteristics in other species, um, but other characteristics may be due to convergent evolution. So you have kind of a patchwork. So here's some questions to ask to think a little bit about um, homology or convergent evolution. So the first question is, are the flowers of water lilies and wild roses homologous or convergent? So phylogenetically, um, here's the phylogeny of the angiosperms, or the flowering plants. Water lilies and roses are both angiosperms. Angiosperms are a monophyletic group of flowering plants. And so this suggests that the common ancestor of the water lily and the wild rose had a flower. And so they both have flowers because they inherited these flowers from their common ancestor. Structurally, the flowers that you see in water lilies and wild roses have all the same parts. They all have petals and sepals and anthers and pistons and pistils and stuff like that. So they're all very similar. Um, and then genetically, they have very similar DNA. And then developmentally, they're also similar. So if you if you trace um, what happens to the same block of cells from the time that they're growing in a bud, those same blocks of cells will become the petals in the different lineages, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you can trace that the developmental patterns are similar in the water lily and in the rose. So the four types of data agree, right? This gives you very strong evidence that flowers and all the different kinds of plant, um, plants within the angiosperms are homologous. Second question. Are the streamlined bodies that you see in dolphins and ichthyosaurs homologous or convergent? So this is an ichthyosaur here. They are extinct aquatic reptiles. So if you see them in fossil form, you can see they got a little ring of bone around the eye, which is specific to reptiles. Dolphins are, what kind of animal is a dolphin? It's a mammal. Yeah, they're mammals. But they look similar, right? They have streamlined bodies and, you know, a dorsal fin and flippers, right? Um, but if you do a phylogenetic analysis, you can see that these similarities are not due to common ancestor. So the common ancestor of a dolphin and an ichthyosaur would be a mammal-like reptile. So you remember Dimetrodon? Dimetrodon, anybody? Oh, yeah, he's got, like, that big old, big old fin on his back. Yeah, that's a Dimetrodon. So that's uh, the common ancestor of a dolphin and an ichthyosaur. He is not streamlined, does not have a dorsal fin, does not have flippers, right? So the trait was not inherited from the common ancestor. Um, let's see. And so we know that the similarities that we see between dolphins and ichthyosaurs are due to convergent evolution as each of these lineages has adapted to life in the ocean. All right, let's do a phylogeny based on morphological traits. 
Um, so one question people have been debating about for a long time is where, where whales belong on the tree, tree of life, okay? Um, so there's a group of, you know, kind of four-legged things that eat stuff um, called artiodactyls, okay? Um, so artiodactyls have some features in common. They have hooves, right? They have an even number of toes. And then one other feature they have in common is if you look at their ankle bone, they have this weird pulley-shaped ankle bone called an astragalus, okay? So the astragalus is a synapomorphy for the artiodactyls. They all have it. Whales got no ankles, so they got no astragalus. Um, so in the older uh, phylogenetic trees based on morphological data, whales were put as an outgroup to the artiodactyls. They don't have an astragalus, they don't have hooves or toes, we really have a hard time placing them anywhere, okay? But now that we can sequence DNA from all of these different species, we know that if you look at whales, their DNA most closely resembles the DNA of hippos. So we think whales are a sister group to the hippos. Um, but if whales and hippos were sister taxa, this would require two changes to the astragalus trait, right? So if whales are an outgroup, the astragalus could have appeared only one time, and that would be very parsimonious. But if whales are closely related to hippos... Yes, dog, do you have a question? No, I'm just barking. Um, the astragalus was gained and then lost in the whale lineage. Okay. So this is less parsimonious than the tree with one change. However, we can pull in other pieces of information. Dog, if you have a problem, you should probably go in the hall and deal with it. I just... I'm just barking. Okay, could you not? Well, oh, maybe. Um, so, do you remember from 1113 when we talked about um, transposons, also known as jumping genes? We looked at ALU, particular jumping gene. So what are those about? Oh, yeah, those are like... Uh, Little pieces of DNA that like copy themselves and stick themselves into your uh, into your genome somewhere else because they're like selfish elements that are trying to copy themselves and that's it. Yeah, right. Yep, that's what it is. So one of these kinds of transposons is a sign or a short interspersed nuclear element, and so the sign will just copy itself and stick itself somewhere in the genome, and where they do this, um, this is kind of a rare event when they do this, but um, it, you know, it could be anywhere in the genome. So if they stick themselves in a very particular spot in the genome, um, this is unlikely to happen convergently in more than one genome. And if we compare where the signs have stuck themselves, um, we see that whales and hippos have signs in common with each other that they don't have with anybody else. So whales and hippos share four unique signs. Um, and so the, the chance on having a sign that's the same by convergent evolution is extremely rare. And so this strongly supports the idea that whales and hippos are closely related. Uh, even though um, whales and hippos, um, even though the tree that has whales and hippos as sister species is a little bit less parsimonious. Um, so now most biologists accept the hypothesis that whales descended from land-dwelling artiodactyls that fed in shallow water you know, kind of hippo-like ancestors. And in 2001, fossil artiodactyls were found that also support this hypothesis. So they found a kind of a transitional form of an artiodactyl that has a very unusual ear bone that's similar to a whale ear bone, and also a pulley-shaped astragalus. So this kind of combination of DNA sequence data and the fossil data really cemented the relationship between whales and artiodactyls. Are they kissing? Well, I just drew them that way, that they're kissing. That's wrong. I mean, it is probably wrong. All right, so how do we know that whales are closely related to hippos? If you guys were in person, I would have one person in each table pretend that they were not at all convinced that whales and hippos are closely related, and then everyone else in the table convinced them. Um, so I will pretend that I am not convinced that whales and hippos are closely related, and then you have to convince me. So here I go. Whales, they don't have an astragalus. 
you put whales next to hippos, the tree's less parsimonious, so I don't think whales are closely related to hippos. Okay. No, you're not supposed to agree with me. You're supposed to convince me that I'm wrong. Oh, okay. All right, anyone want to try? Here, I'll remind you what data we have. What data do we have here? Oh, we have DNA evidence that whales and hippos are closely related. Yeah, we have DNA evidence. What else? We have signs that whales and hippos share that nobody else shares. Yeah, we got that. And what else do we have? We have fossils that are like transitional that have like a whale ankle and a whale ear and an artiodactyl ankle, I mean. Yep. Okay. All right, I'm convinced. Yay! Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about the fossil record now. So we need the fossil record, right? Because it tells us what organisms looked like in the past, where they were and when they were. Uh, when we talk about a fossil, we mean physical evidence from an organism that lived in the past. And when we talk about the fossil record, we just mean the total collection of fossils that have been found throughout the world. And a fossil could be like a whole insect um, stuck in amber, it could be something that ended up kind of smushed down by layers of sediment, something that um, the, you know, there was a shell of like a nautilus or something, and as a shell decomposed, it was replaced with, with, um, with rock. Uh, you can have a permineralized, permineral, permineralized fossil where the um, decomp decomposition happened extremely slowly, and um, so that the level of detail that you can actually see may be on the level of the cells. So you can actually see organelles inside of cells because the material in the cells were replaced so slowly. And you can find trace fossils. Um, this could be like a footprint or a bite mark or anything like that. So we can um, uh, estimate the age of a fossil based on the nearby rock layers. And I should point out that fossils only form under very particular conditions. So in order to make a fossil, you have to have a dead animal be buried rapidly and decompose slowly. And so fossilization, fossilization is really rare. It is also really hard to find fossils, right? So that's also rare. So for example, whoops, there are 12 specimens of Archaeopteryx, the first bird-like dinosaur in the fossil record. Um, but if we we know from other kinds of data that only one in 200 million individuals are fossilized and discovered. There were probably a lot more Archaeopteryx that didn't get preserved. There's some things that limit what kinds of fossils you're likely to find. The first one is called habitat bias. Um, so you're more likely to have organisms become fossilized if they live in areas where sediment is being deposited, like beaches and swamps. And even within these beaches and swamps, Organisms that live below the ground are more likely to be covered up and made into fossils than stuff that lives above ground. There's a taxonomic and tissue bias, so stuff that's hard and crunchy decays more slowly and is more likely to leave fossils than stuff that's soft and squishy. Um, some kinds of tissues with a really tough outer coat, like pollen, tend to fossilize much more easily than other things. Uh, there's a temporal bias. What's temporal mean? Time. Yeah, time. So fossils that are more recent are more common than ancient fossils, you know, because the more ancient ones are more likely to have gotten broken up or whatever. There's an abundance bias. So organisms that were abundant, widespread, and present for a long time are likely to leave many more fossils than species that are rare, local, or ephemeral. So what's ephemeral mean? It means that it's come and gone. Yeah, it doesn't stay for very long. Okay, so the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and the first evidence of life on Earth um, is from about 3.5 billion years ago. And so we consider the period of time from the formation of the solar system to uh, when you start to see animals occur as the Precambrian era. Uh, and then that the Precambrian ends at 541 million years ago when the animal groups appeared. But before that, Everything was unicellular. There was nothing that was more than one cell in size. Also, in the first two billion years of the Earth's life, there was no oxygen, either in the atmosphere or in the water. Um, the oxygen has all been produced by photosynthetic bacteria um, that generated the oxygen. Okay, oops, let me just show you. 
Now we're going into the Phanerozoic, which is this little bit here from 541 million years ago to the present. The Phanerozoic can be broken into three eras, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. Um, just to give you a flavor for the different, the different eras in the Paleozoic, that's when you start to see most of the major animal lineages appear, and so you start to see animals, land plants, and fungi um, appear and diversify. You also get the first uh, land animals. In the Mesozoic, dinosaurs were the dominant terrestrial vertebrates, and gymnosperms were the dominant plant. So gymnosperms are cone-bearing plants. And if you look around, um, for most of the Mesozoic, you don't see any flowers. And then right at the end, you start to see here flowering plants. Um, the Cenozoic, mammals were the largest terrestrial vertebrates. And angiosperms, flowering plants, were the dominant terrestrial plants. We are currently, I guess we can say we're in the Holocene epoch, but there is a new epoch that has been proposed to be adopted called the Anthropocene. And so scientists have argued that humans have made enough of a difference in the fossil record. If people were to come back and find the earth, they would notice a major difference in the species alive. And we would say that was caused by human induced change. And so they would like to name this period, this epoch that we're in now, the Anthropocene. Okay, so let's talk about the appearance and the disappearance of species. Um, but first, I have to define adaptive radiation and give you some examples. So an adaptive radiation is the rapid production from a single lineage of many descendant species. So you got one species and then suddenly you have lots. You can see an adaptive radiation in the fossil record because as you're looking over time, you're seeing nothing, 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 and then lots of different species in a lineage. In a phylogenetic analysis, this is when you see a tree with rapid diversification, and it could be even so rapid that you end up with a polytomy because you can't figure out which splits occurred first. Um, <clears throat> so for example, um, an adaptive radiation would be what happened on the Hawaiian Islands, where you had um, a tarweed that kind of appeared on the Hawaiian Islands and then diversified to form 30 species of the Hawaiian silver sorts that look like this. Um, so these silver swords fulfill the three landmarks of adaptive radiation. First, they're all a monophyletic group. They speciated ra rapidly, and they diversified ecologically into many niches. All right, so do you remember what a niche is? It's like um, environmental places where you live. Yeah, it's kind of environmental places where you live. <coughs> Can we get more specific? It's like the range of ecological conditions where you can live. Yeah, it's the range of resources that a species can use and the range of conditions it can tolerate. So you could have one niche would be, you know, to live over here on the sandy plains. One of them could be live on rocky outcroppings. One of them could be living in shade, right? These are all different ecological niches. Um, so you can have adaptive radiations happen for one of two triggering reasons. The first would be an extrinsic factor. What's extrinsic mean? Uh, it means from outside. Yeah. So this is when you have the appearance of a favorable new condition in the environment. So that's something that happens outside. You can also have an intrinsic factor. So what's intrinsic? Uh, it's when it happens from within. Yeah. So this is when you have some kind of a mutation that leads to a key morphological, physiological, or behavioral trait. So in the example I just gave you, five million years ago, there were very few other flowering plants on the Hawaiian Islands. And so when the tarweeds la landed there, there were very few competitors. Um, so the colonizing tarweeds could grow in many different habitats. And so like the tarweeds that grew in, you know, the kind of open deserty areas, um, any of them that had mutations that allowed them to survive in desert environments, um, adapted to those particular environments, right? So the silver swords diversified into all of the different niches, you know, on the rocks, in the desert, uh, I don't know, underneath tall trees, whatever. So each of the different populations had different mutations happening. Um, so they differed by genetic drift, but also natural selection for the particular location where they were found. All right, another example would be um, this kind of adaptive radiation of the 150 species of Anolis lizards of the Caribbean islands. 
Uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but these kinds of lizards can vary a little bit in their habitat and their body shape. So the ones that live on twigs um, tend to have little short legs and little short tails um, that help them kind of move around on these little short twigs. Uh, the ones that run around on the tree bark have long legs for running and then a long tail for balance. So Losos and his group used DNA sequence data to estimate the phylogeny of the Anolis lizards. And uh, his hypothesis is that there was a mini radiation that occurred on each Caribbean island. So each um, island had a colonizing population and there were no other competitors there. So that colonizing population diversified to occupy all of the available niches. So what he found is that the lizard species on each island was monophyletic. And so the first colonist was specialized for a particular niche. So for example, on the island of Hispaniola, the first colonist was a specialist lizard who lived on trunks and crowns. But the lizards that found themselves on twigs um, or on the ground, um, who had mutations that allowed them to live there, ended up you know, living there and adapting to that new environment. Um, so you had a radiation to all of the other niches. Uh, on the island of Jamaica, you had colonization by one of those little lizards that lives on twigs, or I guess a population of them. And so that was ancestral. And then um, you had mutations occur in the populations that were on the trunk or the ground or the crown or wherever to allow them to live there. So the first colonist was specialized for a particular niche, but a different niche on each island. Um, and then adaptive radiation filled the other niches on each island. And so you ended up on each island, you know, you'll find a lizard that can live on a twig and on the crown and on the trunk, right? But they are basically similar in appearance because of convergent evolution. They convergently evolved to live in all of the different places on the tree. They were not similar in appearance because they had a common ancestor. Okay, so in the history of life, we have a lot of evolution of key traits that triggered important diversification events. Flowers, so the, the, the innovation of a flower as a trait um, was what triggered the diversification of angiosperms. So angiosperms are the most species rich lineage of land plants and there's over 250,000 species of them now. Similarly, feathers and wings gave some dinosaurs the ability to fly, and the bird lineage contains about 10,000 species that live in virtually every habitat on Earth. So just that innovation, the flower or the, the feathers and wings, um, allowed these lineages to have an adaptive radiation. Okay, so now let's back to the history of life here. Um, so the Cambrian explosion, right? So as I mentioned before, almost all the organisms on Earth were unicellular um, for the first three billion years after life originated. First, we start to see sponges around 635 million years ago, but then 50 million years later, suddenly you have animals becoming larger and more complex and very diverse. And so this diversification is known as the Cambrian explosion. So you go from having very few species of animals to lots of species of animals. Uh, you can see here, this is the Burgess Shale in Canada. You can see all of the kind of layers, and this is a great place for looking at the Cambrian explosion in the fossil record. People have been asking what triggered the Cambrian explosion, and there are four major hypotheses. These hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. So what does that mean? It means that, like, maybe more than one is true at the same time. Yeah, maybe more than one could be true at the same time. All right, the first hypothesis is that um, because at the start of the Cambrian explosion, oxygen levels on Earth were very high. This allowed for organisms that could um, use aerobic respiration to move much faster and become much larger. Second, um, there was suddenly the, you know, like this diversification of predators. So predators started eating, you know, prey items, and the prey items, um, there was selection for shells and exoskeletons of rapid movement and other defenses, and then once those defenses arose, there was selection for adaptation in the predators to, you know, avoid the defenses, to be able to continue to eat the prey, and so this caused a rapid kind of back and forth coevolution between predators and prey. Uh, third, animals were able to move off of the ocean floor, and at this point they could exploit new resources which created new niches. So, you know, you have animals that are living 
I don't know, on the sides of the rock faces, and then predators who ate the animals on the side of the rock faces, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, causing more speciation and divergence. And then fourth, we have kind of an intrinsic characteristic here. Um, there was suddenly, well, we think that potentially um, gene duplication and diversification in animal Hox genes made it possible to kind of very rapidly produce new different kinds of bodies. So do you remember from Bio 1113 what Hox genes are? I don't remember. Okay, anyone remember from Bio 1113? Yeah, they're master controller genes. Yeah, so what kind of stuff do they control? The uh, rate and timing of development. Yeah, they control the rate and timing of development. So if you adjust the Hox genes, you can end up creating completely different body shapes by making, you know, maybe more segments, or this part of the body is big and that part's little, or this part is over here and that part's over there, right? So these are the 13 different kinds of Hox genes. And so you can see that, that we have had many duplication events in which the Hox genes have been doubled and doubled and doubled, um, which creates very different body forms. All right, so let's go over this. What was the Cambrian explosion? That was when all the animals appeared. <coughs> True. So what are the four factors that may have caused the Cambrian explosion? Predators. Yeah, it could be predators causing... What do the predators cause? Coevolution with prey. Yeah. What else? Oxygen! There was more oxygen so they could have more aerobic respiration and go faster and be bigger. Yeah. What else? Oh, there was those hox genes. There was diversification in hox genes. Yeah. There's that one. And then there was getting up off the ocean floor, made more niches. Yep, that's them. Are these hypotheses mutually exclusive? No. All right, so looking at the history of life on Earth, we have to talk about mass extinctions. Mass extinction is kind of the opposite of an adaptive radiation. It is the rapid extinction of a large number of diverse organisms around the world. So we say that a mass extinction occurs when at least 60% of the species present are wiped out within 1 million years. So mass extinctions are caused by various catastrophic events. And so you can think of them as the opposite, as I said, of an adaptive radiation. So this is just showing the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, maybe 6 um, mass extinctions on Earth. Before we talk about mass extinctions, though, we need to distinguish a mass extinction from background extinction. So background extinction is just this lower average rate of extinction. Stuff goes extinct all the time, right? It could be because of normal environmental change or different diseases appear, new predators, new com competitors, right, can cause a species to go extinct. But a mass extinction is the result of an, of an extraordinary, sudden, and temporary change in the environment. And so this, you know, is when you suddenly have extinction due to exposure to something very harsh and short term like volcanic eruptions um, or, you know, an uh, asteroid hitting the Earth. So paleontologists traditionally have recognized five historic mass extinctions. Um, so the end Permian was the largest mass extinction. Um, we think that one was caused by volcanic activity and 90% of all species appeared from the end Permian extinction event. Um, the most recent one to, well, kind of, the most recent one is the end Cretaceous extinction. This one was caused by an asteroid striking the Earth, and this caused the extinction of 60 to 80 percent of the multicellular species. After the, that um, extinction event, mammals were able to diversify to fill all the niches that were left empty by the extinction of the dinosaurs. We should note at this point, though, that the, the fact that the mammals could do this was not because mammals had some kind of competitive superiority due to their feathers and lactation. Instead, they were able to survive, and so, you know, the, their ability to survive had nothing to do with fur or lactation. It was instead due to a chance event. Um, so they kind of got lucky, and then mammals were able to gain dominance. Many scientists propose that life on Earth is on the verge of a sixth mass extinction due to factors that we're very familiar with, habitat loss, pollution, overfishing, invasive species, and climate change. 
So the current extinction rate that we are having in the here and now is 1,000 times higher than the background extinction rate. It is the highest extinction rate since the asteroid impact. All right, so hopefully you learned about how we study the history of life through phylogenetic trees in the fossil record. And we looked at, we looked at how major um, changes happen in the diversity of life through adaptive radiation and mass extinction.